Uh, today is about property rights and economic development. So what we're trying to do today and tomorrow and Friday is to concentrate on a few key areas and see how law and legal frameworks and institutions are working to help economic development in those areas. So what we're doing today is to see how LFIs affecting um, economic development in the area of, of property rights. Why property rights? In almost every law reform project, the presumption is individual right to property is a key to economic development. We need to understand that because the, so much emphasis has been made in this area. So any law and development project, law reform, property tends to be mentioned. So we need to know why. And uh, some of you may not have a strong background in property. That's fine. So I'd like to spend a few minutes going over the basic elements that are common to different jurisdictions vis-a-vis uh, -vis property rights. So let's begin with the definition of property rights. What, what are property rights? Again, uh, through different jurisdictions, property rights tend to refer to rights to possess, control, and transfer property. So three elements have to be there um, in order to assess rights to property. Possession, control, and transfer. Do you have to have all of that in order to have a property right? No. But a right to property tends to rep represent in one or more of these elements. Okay. Now, what is the subject to property? Now, many jurisdictions, including Anglo-American, some civil law jurisdictions, tend to distinguish between personal and real property. Personal property, um, items that are movable, uh, it belongs personally to a, uh, individuals. Real property normally is an estate, non-movable estate, such as a house, land. And much of law reform tends to be focused on real property. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that too. Second, property rights tend to be recognized by formal law. So formal law meaning uh, formal statutes, uh, that's recognized by something that's recognized by state. So it could be a written statute, cases as recognized by state. I had a question whether cases are really formal law. Uh, it depends on the legal system you're in. So in Anglo-American legal system, where judicial cases are binding, binding meaning that the cases can be used as a legal source to adjudicate cases, then yes, cases are formal law. How about the civil law? system where judicial cases are not officially binding. Well, in the strict sense, those cases are not formal law, but in practice, cases from higher courts tend to be respected and followed. Okay, so in that sense, cases in civil law jurisdiction may be called as de facto law, which is law uh, that is applied in practice. So property rights can be recognized by formal law or by custom and convention. What do you mean by this? Well, people have practice of using property uh, to in a certain way. If that has been practiced with consistency on a substantial period of time, then courts in many jurisdictions tend to recognize them. So we'll also uh, take a look at that too. So. Let's go more um, in, into more details of those rights, classifications. So you got the basic idea what, what it really means by property rights. And these rights are categorized into uh, uh, different ways. And one of the most representative category is ownership right. It's a right to possess, control, and transfer. So if you look at the ownership right, it does have all three elements in it. Again, is ownership right absolute? Well, conventional wisdom is it is, but even in a market economy where ownership right is protected to the maximum, it tends to be subject to other competing rights, such as a lien and lease. If somebody has any other right over ownership right, then obviously it's subject to that. What is it? One possibility is possessory right, right to possession. So. 
If you lease somebody else's property, obviously, you don't have ownership right to the property, but you can use the property in the terms of the lease. So that's right to possession. Um, if you're lending a money subject to control of or possession of a movable property, we call it lien. And that is also another prop right that can be attached to owner's rights. So owner's right is not absolute in a sense that it is subject to other competing rights. Third, you could have any other usage right called easement. Easement is property right that entitled user to use uh, mostly a real property uh, for their personal purpose. So these are the the common categories of rights and you could find in uh, most jurisdictions, ownership, possessory, and some easement. How do you give that property right? right. Normally for movable properties, in many jurisdictions, possession, the legal possession, legitimate possession, tends to represent that right. So you don't need to register that uh, in certain ways. But for <coughs> real property, then you have to have a system of recognizing that right. So many law reforms are centered around this um, need. They try to create a system, the law and institutions and frameworks, to register the land. That has been a conventional wisdom, right? Again, um, it has some of the issues that we need to discuss. These property rights are contrasted with another very useful and uh, familiar right called contractual. So one of the things that practitioners and, and academics would have to distinguish is the importance of property right vis-a-vis -vis contractual right. Now, uh, one of the questions in my class has been that, look, um, how do you, if I have a contract with a property holder A in terms of using, say, his driveway, I, I want his driveway. He doesn't have a car. I do have a car. I want to use his driveway. So we can sign a contract. We're going to cover the issues of a contract tomorrow. A piece of paper that says, look, um, I want to use your property for um, um, driveway purpose. Is that a property right? The question is no. Why is it? Well, because the way that I'm using his property is by promise between me and the property holder. So that's a right that has to be um, maintained by people. So that we call contract. Property, you don't need that. Property is a right attached to the property itself and you don't need anybody else to enforce those rights. More more precisely, to maintain those rights. So property right is attached to the property itself Contract right is a right that has been given by promise of people. So these are different things. Okay. So some easement, for instance, the right to use somebody else's property, can be done by contract, by making promise, or by attaining property right. In some cases, you need registration because you do not rely on the promise of person. So one of the easiest ways to distinguish between property right and contract right is property right is granted by state, granted and recognized by state. Contract right is granted by promise, binding promise between people. Okay? Again, um, if the distinction is not yet clear, um, I guess our coverage tomorrow on, on business relations and contract could help. But let me leave it here, um, and distinction is, is important here. Now, then why do we bother with property rights? Because property rights are considered a basis for private business transactions. In order to have business, you have to transfer a goods of value, right? And you can't really do transaction and create economic value unless you have something that is yours to transfer, right? So what it means here is in order to have and economic transactions um, between private individuals and corporations. You need property rights so that you can 
transact items of economic value that belongs to you properly. Especially those property rights, for that reason, would have to be recognized by state. So we call that formal property rights. So whenever this term formal appears, that means the property rights recognized by state. Okay? And again, the conventional wisdom is for business transaction reasons and efficiency reasons that you need formal property rights for economic development. All right. Now let's uh, <coughs> take a look at this in more details. So formal property rights, uh, FEPR in acronym, is a legally recognized rights in property held by private parties. The private parties including individuals and companies, and again, uh, for the reasons I've explained, FPPR is essential for economic development. Adam Smith, uh, the renowned British academic in the 18th century, considered founder of market economy, has made it very clear that security of property rights against expropriation by state or other fellow citizens are essential for economic growth. Without personal property rights recognized by state, you will not have economic growth. This position has been reinforced by new institutional economics. Uh, that's a new trend of economics that emphasized the role of institutions in economics. And representative scholars are uh, Ronald Coase, uh, Demsetz, and North. Uh, I think North got Nobel Prize in the 90s. They also reinforced this position and argued that property rights are crucial to economic performance. So in order to have a vibrant economic performance, property rights are the basis. They even went further. Douglas North and Robert Thomas, um, new institutional economics scholars, have mentioned that the rise of the Western world is owed to the creation and development of private property ownership. So the reason that we have dominant Western economy and even civilization is owed to the recognition of FPPR. So according to all this, FPPR is a cornerstone of modern economy. Hence, how can you have modern economic development without FPPR? That's how it works. Let's look at the recent trend and uh, examine this claim even further. Now, we saw the fall of communism, communism in the 1990s. Why communism failed? They, there was a military, political, and economic reasons. We focus on economic reasons as to why. Throughout the communist rule, after World War II all the way to um, 80s, especially going into 60s and 70s and 80s, the lack of the, 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 the fall of productivity in the economy was very clear meaning that the corporations do not produce as much, people do not produce as much going into 80s and 90s. And why? Well, there are many analyses. One of them is the lack of personal property in communism. Obviously, in communism, you do not have a um, FPPR uh, to major properties, and the lack of it took away incentive from people systematically. So when the zeal of communist revolution gone away, then people looked for themselves, and they found out that there is no great incentive for, in a way, working very hard, innovatively. So one explanation is lack of FPPR in the communist regime led to economic inefficiency and welfare loss. One anecdote is, um, you know, that the South Korea, uh, North Korea, the two Koreas are divided. And one of the comments that South Korean businessmen who travel to North Korea make is, well, they're under a very oppressive you know, regime, and people are directed to do a lot of things in the factory and, uh, and the farm field. But they commonly observe that actually work done isn't as much as you would imagine, right? Um, you think that in communist rule, you're under strict instructions, uh, monitored by various parties. So you might think that the productivity has to be maintained because of those compulsion, but it's not. The productivity of many factories and the farm field 
um, and those remaining few communist countries, including North Korea, didn't seem to be very strong. Why is it? Well, you can relate this to lack of FPPR. Going more into in North Korea, but on the other hand, um, you know, the populations in North Korea have created these unauthorized marketplaces. Now the state um, recognizes them informally because they are there, and what happens is that the productivity observed in those marketplaces, informal marketplaces, tend to be a lot higher than formally recognized places. So all this tend to support that FPPR is important for economic efficiency, hence economic development. So, FPPR has been brought out. But there has been a little bit of deviation here. That is, um, if you are academically oriented and going back to new institutional economics, and you would realize that the arguments made by NEE is actually quite broad, meaning that when they talked about the importance of property rights in the NIE context, uh, they're not really talking only about law. They're talking about special norms, customs, convention, but then the project um, on law and development in uh, the property tends to focus more on FPPR vis-a-vis uh, -vis other conventions and norms that we will cover later as well. So one thing is that in academics stream, uh, importance of FPPR has been highlighted to the point that the whole Western civilization stands on it, some argue. But um, Another trend is that in actual practice and consultation, the, the, the focus, the sharp focus, has been made on FPPR, the formal property rights recognized by state. So it won't be overstatement to say that conventional wisdom today is that FPPR, that's private property right recognized by state, is the key for economic development and any law reform would have to include a measure of that reform, okay? However, the life is not that simple, <laughs> as many people say, and we have a problem here. We have inconsistencies going against conventional wisdom. One, observation seems to be mixed. So we do know all these aspirations and uh, prescriptions, analysis that points to the importance of FPPR for economic development. It seems intuitive. It, it seems almost common sense. But if you actually make observations on the ground, the outcome is mixed. Um, and we need to take a look at that, especially if you're interested in consultation work and law reform projects regarding uh, property, then this mixed observation, mixed outcome has some uh, importance. Now, there are some observations, obviously, and I will go over that, indicating positive correlations between FPPR and economic development. And there are others without strong link between FPPR and economic development. And those of you who came to my conference uh, in April might have noted from uh, the Frank Upham's speech that it's not only inconsistent, but it actually worked to destabilize and cause great harm to society. Okay? So, Let me see if I could uh, find some uh, cases here. Okay, I'll, um, it'll have to come a little later. But um, let me see why then the cause for inconsistencies. Now, as we'll see later, there are institutional issues. So yes, FPPR can contribute to economic development, but you need a certain institutional arrangement before that. And you have to also look at divergent social and cultural norms. The different cultures have different perceptions about common property, individual property, something in between, so you need to know them too. And also, effective of, effectiveness of state seems to matter because rights will have to be enforced if they are not complied, 
And if we don't have that clear link between compliance and enforcement, um, I tried to explain some of that yesterday, then you have a problem there. And as noted, not only we have mixed observations between FPPR and economic development, there is an observation that supports the proposition that misplaced FPPR can cause great harm to society and disruption to economic development. And two noted scholars, um, Guang Dong Su and Frank Upham, uh, seem to make this argument. And Frank Upham <coughs> makes a very interesting <coughs> observation in this, that Robust enforcement of legal norms, which has been advocated by uh, law reform projects across the, across the globe. So robust enforcement of legal norms, including the existing property rights, in fact may inhibit socioeconomic changes and the creation of net social benefit that may be necessary to achieve economic development. So what Frank Opham says here is not only enforcing existing FPPR can disrupt economic development process. We're going to introduce concrete cases of that. It could also inhibit further social progress. So he makes some examples of it. Let me introduce a little bit here. That existing property rights need to be destroyed to promote economic growth. So another equation here is, for the reasons that we will explain um, through cases, not only FPPR should not be blindly uh, complied and enforced, but you have to see the point of necessity at some times to uh, the need of breaking the existing FPPR to enhance economic development. This is ironic, I realize, but um, we'll have to see that perspective and see how that plays out in um, actual development cases here. Okay, So what, do you, what does he mean by you need to destroy FPPR to encourage economic development. He uh, lays out some you know, examples here. Let me recite it. Now, the, in history, the village's right to enter the common were destroyed by the 16th century enclosure of English fields to allow monoculture and sheep pasturage. We are talk talking about the famous enclosure movement in UK, where common land has been enclosed. It has been, um, access has been cut by the social elite to raise new industry, that it's a ship uh, pasturage. The problem with that is it was a property right pre prevalent at the time for the commons. That has been curtailed to spur another economic growth. In America, the right to clean water was one of many property rights destroyed to allow industrialization in the 19th century. He's talking about mining. So in order to increase mining, the right to clean water at the time, which is uh, FPPR has been compromised and destroyed. In Japan, the economic and social status of Japanese landlords was eliminated by land reform in order to build post-war democracy. So in order to, in this case, enhance social progress, the FPPR reserved by uh, landlords, not only in Japan and Korea, had to be destroyed uh, to make progress. In China in the 20th century, the communal right the village's agricultural production, obviously property right, was destroyed with the industrialization of agriculture. So here, yes, there is an emphasis on FPPR and need to recognize and enforce it, but in history showed that destruction of FPPR was as sometimes necessary to enhance economic development. So that complicates the equation we're dealing with here, but let's look at that one by one. Now, in order to understand this inconsistency and complications, we need to be clear as to why FPPR um, really helps economic development. And that obviously, we saw some intuitive elements, and primarily from the perspective of individual motivation. If, it, if something is yours, you're likely to be more efficient with it. That was the proposition, which I think is correct. But we need to look at other elements to understand really why FPPR um, can work. And if you see the gap in here, then that's the reason why we see a great degree of inconsistency on the field. Okay, So let's look at the economies of uh, FPPR. Now, 
The opposite to FPPR would be open access. So you got an open access to property, common property, right? Now the common property tends to work to reduce available resources. What do you mean by that? Well, everybody can access that common property. So the property, whatever is on that, is finite. And obviously, by common access, reduction will be there. People will use it. But that use by somebody in that community will have economic consequences. If somebody is using it, then obviously others cannot. So, but it's a common property. So obviously there is no incentive for any individual to use the resource optimally. So this is intuitive too, I think. And if everybody has an access to a property, then everybody will just use it as he or she wants without consideration to the others that could happen. And as a result, you can, uh, you can uh, cause waste. So private property right Right holder captures all the benefits and cost of holder's decision and property. So if it were to be a private property, obviously all the benefits are confined to the user, the right holder, and the cost. If that person wastes that property, then obviously the cost belongs only to him, not the others. So that's incentive to use resources efficiently, and that should lead to economic development according to this theory. And also, FPPR induces transferability. So by recognizing FPPR, you can enable resources move from less efficient to the more efficient. So let's say that I'm a farmer um, who can you know, uh, harvest, say, a cert certain amount of, say, 100 units of um, you know, barley from certain land, and I'm making X amount of money, now, the farmer B is obviously more efficient. He can do, say, 200 units out of it. And because he can make much more money, um, he can pay for my property uh, more than I can get from that property. So from my perspective, I can get even more money by selling that property to more efficient farmer, right? So FPPR enables move the move of property from the less efficient to more efficient. And the key element in that transferability will be FPPR. On the other hand, if the property is common property, then obviously you can't really transfer that to another community. So this transfer of resources from the less efficient to more efficient should obviously lead to economic growth and development. And also, because FPPR is enforced by state, it should lead to better enforcement. Common property um, could also be recognized by state, enforced by state, but because you have a private stakeholder in um, FPPR, then the point of enforcement is more sharp in the sense that the state has a focused interest group in here to enforce the property, so that leads to better enforcement. And FPPR are more efficient by avoiding using resources to self-defense or invasion. And it lowers the social cost of enforcement by developing in personal court system. What it means here, I think, is it's more efficient in a way that because the state is involved in here. And that's the reason, as we'll see later on, why FPPR doesn't work in other places. But in other, you know, uh, at the outset at least, FPPR is recognized and enforced by states, so you don't have to have these private parties, whether it's corporations or individuals, have to use any of their resource to self-defense it. You know, you don't have to spend time on economic resource to protect it. It's protected by state. That has a um, Incidental effect of increasing social peace, and obviously social peace is also important, as we discussed yesterday, for sustained economic development. And you do have predict predictability because you know that FPPR is uh, enforced by state, so in transactions, distributions, planning, you have a degree of predictability 
out of the system. And because state is involved in force, you do have a consistency. And also here, another very important um, aspect here is economies of scale. Now, when the state enforces FPPR, it does so by system. It doesn't do that case by case, in theory at least. So what they do is they have a standardized enforcement mechanism that applies across the nation. So you do have this uh, very standardized enforcement and which creates economic scale in a sense that the people can plan and um, carry out economic projects on reliance that those rights are enforced uh, in a standardized fashion in the same way across the state. So you don't have to plan for contingencies um, to the extent that you might have to if property rights would have to be enforced and recognized by private parties. So because of that, this standardizing um, the elements and enforceability, it tends to promote business on an extended basis. So here's another aspect. If property rights are only recognized and practiced and enforced by a small number of community, then you can really do business in that group because outside that group, you don't really know what's going to happen to the right as you recognize and want to use. But if FPPR is enforced and practiced throughout the nation, then then is a uh, you can do the business on such an extended basis with predict predictability. So on the other side of this story is, the state is important in maintaining and recognizing FPPR. So yes, FPPR seems to be very efficient and, and essential for economic development. But because FPPR relies on a lot of things here, the state capacity, uh, enforcement mechanism, consistency, standardization, all this have to be there before FPPR can be used for economic development. These are the cases we have to look at a little later. Now, another thing that um, the development agencies are advocating for FPPR is FPPR is linked to the development of financial market. So another argument here is FPPR encourages asset-based investment they're lowering risks of insecurity and expropriation. So if you have a well-recognized and enforced FPPR, then financial market can grow out of it because they can then now use this asset as a base for investment. Okay? And obviously, development of financial market is crucially important for economic development. I think in all of successful development cases, you had a stable development of financial markets, and there is a link between FPPR and investment and financial markets because um, the assets protected by FPPR can be a great device for financial markets. So FPPR facilitates the development of financial markets, as I said, and transfer properties essential for economic development. So let me reiterate here. When property rights are clear and secure, the transaction cost involved in identifying the real owner of the property and making and enforcing a lease or sale contract are reduced. The transaction cost is reduced thanks to property rights. To the extent that the property markets can function effectively, in transferring the property from the less efficient uses to more efficient uses. So some argue, the scholars argue that one of the most important aspects of FPPR, again, is um, encouragement and improvement of property transfer, property transfer. And if you look at uh, the cases of uh, the failed development, uh, such as uh, communist countries in the 80s, uh, some of the Latin American countries, you could observe that the rate of property transfer was fairly low. The property wasn't really moving 
um, you know, uh, from party to party, from corporation to corporation, part because um, the lack of FPPR or the problems with enforcing and recognizing FPPR uh, might have been the reason for low transferability in that economy. So these are all um, the strengths of FPPR. But again, if you have listened to me closely, then FPPR is conditional upon many elements, including institutional uh, makeup and, and state capacity. So the difficulty, I think, here is when development agencies were trying to foster uh, FPPR improvements in developing countries, then they did not really take a close look at those elements that are necessary to recognize and enforce FPPR properly. So we're going to go through the cases um, of uh, failure and cases of difficulty, and you will commonly observe uh, those lacking elements. Now, before I going, uh, go into evidence of inconsistent uh, cases, do you have any questions? No. Hmm. Either I'm very clear or <laughs> well, I like to think that. How about Ashish? Are you okay with this? Ashish? Okay. I'll, uh... Sorry, Steve. I was on mute. Uh, can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, I could. I'm so, good. Uh, I'm good. I was Thank wondering uh, if you had any questions or comments or no. Let I'm me good, Steve. More. This is great. Okay, no good. Questions. Okay, then I'll uh, I'll move to uh, uh, the cases of inconsistencies, and I'll give you a ten minute break after that. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll move to there. All right. So the embarrassment here is that FPPR is supposed to be working uh, good for economic development. Um, we're not really uh, put into uh, efficient use, and you need to see why there is an inconsistency. Now, again, the Frank Upham, uh, who's been observing this for decades, seemed to say that low-end low property rights have not only a single role, but there are a variety of roles. A single role that I mentioned is the law and property rights should enhance economic development and all the necessary changes associated with that. But actual observation is not. He says they have played a variety of roles. Sometimes attempted to change in property rights slowed the process of change, not accelerated it, but slowed it, sometimes legitimizing the, the changes associated with development, sometimes to becoming the very agent of change, including economic development, sometimes playing no role at all. So this is a bit of embarrassing observation because what it says from the cases is that law and property rights and FPPR does not have a single role in the society that is to promote economic development. So we begin with the common observation, which is um, emphasized by development agents today, is that the cases of lower productivity are observed commonly in the use of common land. Common ownership leading to resource degradation, we explained that, and uh, resource depletion. That's widely perceived low productivity of firms under communist regimes. And there are further examples here. Um, so inconsistency layer one is that the position, the cases that support FPPR. So let's go over those cases first and the other cases. Now, interesting cases, Arab Tribesmen, the Libyan province of uh, uh, Tripolitania, used a communal land for low-valued uses. So they observed the use of common property, uh, tribal property, in Libya, but they're used for low-valued uses, such as growing occasional crops of barley and grazing privately owned sheep and goats. So it's you know a scattered use, a sporadic use. It doesn't create huge economic benefit. 
rather than more profitable activities such as almond tree planting. So there are things they can do on those land, and obviously almond tree planting is used supposed to be more profit, but they just tend to use it for more menial use, uh, more lower value use, rather than uh, more profitable use. In U.S., labor productivity was higher in privately leased oyster grounds than in government regulated open access grounds. More oysters per product, you know, per labor was was uh, was produced in government land, government uh, grounds than uh, the private. So it was less production from government land. More interestingly. In a sample of 39 Indian reservations to estimate the effect of land tenure on agriculture pro productivity, per acre value of agriculture output is 85 to 90 percent lower on tribal trust land than on fee simple land. Fee simple land means private land. And 30 to 40 percent lower on individual trust land than on fee simple land. Trust means it's a common land, you know, land trusted for a common purpose, and productivity gap was rather significant. And there was a test for changes in efficiency in the British Columbia hal halibut fishery following the privatization of property rights. And privatization uh, lead not only to efficient input usage, so they were getting you know, uh, more product per input, but it actually led to a substantial producer surplus. So all in these cases, showing low productivity in common land or common resource and higher productivity in privatized, presumably backed by FPPR. So these are the cases. Let me go a little bit further here. And cases of improvement. So then, okay, so we have observed the low productivity in the common ground. So then privatization has actually increased productivity um, in those land. So there are some cases of improvements here. In Thailand, the farmland security leading to greater capital formulation. Okay, so <coughs> higher capital land ratios and higher levels of land improvement. So privatization uh, led to all this. In China, Land tenure security, which means that the individuals have more secured land title, privatization again, significantly affects land specific investment, more investment on land, and specifically investment in soil quality. So people were carrying more and, and increased productivity there. In India, soil and water conservation investment is significantly lower on leased land in, in two of the study villages and lower on plots that are subject to sales chain restrictions in one village. So, in India, again, conservation investment um, was much lower on leased land or higher in, in private. In Vietnam, the Land Law of 1993, which gave thousands the power to exchange, transfer, lease, inherit, and mortgage, which means privatize their uh, the rights, is found to lead to significant increase in the share of total area devoted to multi-year crops and to some increases in irrigation investment. So they do more investment, they harvest more when their rights have been privatized. We're talking about Vietnam here. Brazil. Ownership security uh, playing an important role in promoting investment in land improvements. And land titling and registration are also found to be associated with increased investment in Guatemala and Nicaragua. So all this Brazil and Guatemala and Nicaragua, again, privatization and enhanced security in land, land title, um, resulted in land improvements leading to more crops and more outcome. Also, land <coughs> tenure security is demonstrated to influence the residential investment in urban squatter neighborhoods in Peru and Argentina. You give land security to property and it has a better investment in residents. So um, these are a number of cases that really show that the privatization tend to improve productivity and production. 
The difficulty is a mixed result here. It's many of those mixed results are coming from Africa, not only Africa, but many are from Africa, and we need to take a look at them. There are empirical evidence from Kenya, Uganda, and Zimbabwe provide a little support that registration uh, through improved tenure security has increased investment in agriculture. So you have uh, privatized land title in Kenya, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, and many sections in those countries, it did not lead to any increase in investment. Cross-sectoral evidence from Ghana, Kenya, and Rwanda, and there was a year, 1987-88, shows rather unclear relationship between land rights, so the level of individualization of land rights, especially the extent of transfer, alienation rights, so you know more rights, and land improvements, um, again, the relationship between those, granting those rights and improvements wasn't really clear there. The relative insignificance of the effects of land ownership on investment is further supported by findings from Uganda and Madagascar. By contrast, in a very influential paper, the Bisley uses data from two regions of Ghana, Wasa and um, Angola is not uh, Alonga, uh, Angola. Improvements in the, uh, let me see again, I'm sorry about the Wasa and Alonga, Alonga, including drainage and continuing uh, fertilizing, have no such relationship. Tenure security um, insights farmers to divert scare manure resources to uh, more secure fields. And in Malawi, the tenure security promotes long-term investments and boosts agriculture production. So it looks like some part of Africa at least that privatization has led to more investment and more productivity, and some others that we I've mentioned earlier do not show that. Not only in Africa, in other parts of the world, um, the observation does not really lead to a low productivity in common land or a better um, economic outcome from privatization. So um, Tobel has mentioned that in Switzerland, the use of communal land for cattle grazing, so according to the theory of FPPR, you should see waste, you should see less productivity, but that was not the case. The productivity was maintained for communal land, I'm talking about for centuries, and overgrazing, which is a waste, was prevented by tight control. On the other hand, the privatization of land leading to destruction of na native vegetation in India and the land reform in Japan, granting FPPR to a single family farmer who used to be a, a tenant farmer, did not increase agricultural productivity, notably. So, to be fair, the results are mixed. Notably, the security of property rights reduce man hours to protect property and increase productivity. We did this have been shown. But on the other hand, property rights investments um, perspective enhanced land tenure security, giving pri private rights, and uh, investment improvements in Asia and Latin America were rather mixed, and Africa too. So um, I'll give you a 10-minute break here, and afterwards, uh, if you have any questions or engagements or uh, the comments, we'll, we'll entertain them. And we will go in to see why then FPPR does not lead to consistent improvement in productivity investment as it should, okay? So uh, we'll do a 10-minute break here, and we'll come back at um, 11 here and 1, 1, 1 p.m. in the East, East, Eastern time, okay? Okay. So 10 minutes. Okay, we're back. Uh, so is, every, is everybody back online? Yes, Hello? I'm here. Okay, good. Um, okay, Malawan, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I can okay, hear you. Okay, good. So are you ready? Again, um, now this is very uh, 
not complicated, I wouldn't say, but um, again, the, the law and development which has been done for the past five decades are facing challenges here uh, because uh, many of those projects were not successful after spending billions of dollars. So we're at the juncture of figuring out uh, what is a better way to do this. And I have incorporated some of those controversies in my lecture so that I'm, I, I hope did not complicate too much, but I promise you. And every, you know, towards the end of every lecture, I will uh, depart with concrete, uh, you know, recommendations, both for those of you who are in consultation or in academic endeavor. I'll, I'll try to make sense out of it uh, for you. But um, I will welcome your engagement. So if you have any questions, um, anything that's not clear, let me know. So do you have any? Any comments, any questions? No, it's very clear, I think. OK. All right, then uh, let's move on to the next topic. <coughs> oh, um, we have to still cover evidence of inconsistencies. Uh, the reason we are looking at that is we need to understand what's really happening out there in terms of uh, getting FPPR right and having that contributing to economic development. We saw some cases there. And we also have to look at other cases that FPPR did not work out. Um, so we are continuing on that. And you may recall a credit effects of FP FPPR, meaning that good FPPR is um, instrumental to creating a good financial market because now financial market has a great asset backed by FPPR to be used as a collateral for loans and investments, right? So um, again, this is very intuitive and makes every sense. But again, the result is mixed. There was a positive impact in terms of increasing approval rates in Thailand and Peru. So FPPR has increased approval rates and it's substantial. 5 to 10 percent increase in approval rates. However, in some other countries, like Argentina, there was no significant relationship um, between FPPR and increased uh, the financial market. And as well as in some African case studies uh, in the rural areas, again, you granted FPPR, but there was no significant increase. Um, in uh, financial market development. The land titling increased the property value in the Philippines, Jakarta, Thailand, and in Thailand actually that has increased transactions. But on the other hand, in Brazil, Nicaragua, and Ecuador, uh, the land transaction, I mean, those countries also show some improvements. But land transactions were not significantly affected by land registrations in Africa. And matter of fact, only 16% market transactions are involving FPPR, which is pretty low. And even in a more vibrant economy, such as developing Vietnam. Now, Vietnam has been developing at around 7% every year, which is a significant economic development. But in a major city called Ho Chi Minh City, have the property unregistered. Okay, so this is quite startling because one of the most uh, uh, thriving is real estate markets in the world has been uh, Vietnam, and Ho Chi Minh City was a big part of it. And uh, you know, from preparing for this training course, I've I've seen on record and have the property unregistered. So this is it shows that. Um, you know, at least the uh, FPPR's effect and the necessity for economic development is at best mixed. Okay, then why? Uh, why the inconsistency? Why some places FPPR seems to improve economic uh, efficiency, financial market, some place not? Why? Because we have to have a key factors. There has been a absence of key factors in uh, unsuccessful places. What are those key factors? In order to have a good FPPR, meaning that FPPR contributing to economic development, 
you need, you seem to have a good markets. You have to have a key markets, including credit market, labor market, and insurance market. Beginning with capital market. Increased access to credit market is important, obviously, and success in Thailand showed that. You have a PPR, you have increased um, capital market. In Africa, however, the structure of the capital market there did not allow FPPR to make any contribution in the financial market. Why is it? Well, because in a lot of African countries, there was a problems associated with government dominant financial market. What is it? In Europe, more than 90% of households have a bank account. Okay, less than half of households in many developing countries um, have one. In many African countries, fewer than one in five households has an account. In addition, small firms report a uh, lack of financing to be one of the most important business constraints they face. For example, in Africa, fewer than 20% of small firms use external financing. So, in that case, the impact of land title registration on credit-related increases in capital investment will be reduced substantially. What it means is, in order to have FPPR to take a positive impact, in credit market, you have to have a credit market organized in a way that FPPR can make positive impact, meaning prevalent bank accounts, which did not exist in Africa, and certain development in private financial market, which did not exist in Africa. So that explains in part why FPPR in some places make positive impact in uh, the development of financial market, and some places didn't. You'd have to have a prior capital market development to benefit from FPPR, okay? Also, where informal lending is dominant, where people are not really used to going to credit institution to get loans, but rather you know, rely on... Um, informal financiers, rich guys in the town, so forth, the formal land title has negligible value on credit access. The people have a practice of making a loan uh, based on non-land tenure systems such as personal reputation, uh, peer pressure in the community, culture and tradition. If those are the essential elements of making land uh, loans available, then adding FPPR doesn't seem to work substantially uh, important. Also, in order for FPPR to be used effectively by credit market, you have to have effective judicial system and administrative system to enforce it. If credit market doesn't see a strong enforceability of FPPR, they will not uh, trust FPPR to be a credible asset for their business transactions. Then where does this enforceability come? Again, the effective judicial system and the state capacity which are beyond granting FPPR. And also there is a cost of FPPR. There is a cost of granting uh, private rights. One notable cost is the cost of property registration system. So let me take a look at this. In the World Bank's 2008 Doing Business Report, the mean cost, the average cost associated with property registration in 173 countries amounted to 6.6% .6 of the property's value, which is pretty high. And the mean waiting time was 81 days. The cost of registering property is a highly uh, by model, where it, whereas it is 2% or less of property value in 32 cases. It amounts to 5 to 10% or over 10% property values in 92 um, in 41 cases. In extreme cases, such as Syria, the cost of registering property is about 28 
0.05% of property value. That's a lot. In some other countries, such as Kiribati, it takes 523 days of registered property. So obviously, the system um, requires a uh, substantial economic resource to form and maintain the system of registration. And depending on the economic capacity and, and the mystery of efficiency and infrastructure, the cost is a large. And it has a couple of uh, two impacts. One is that not many people will be able to benefit from it. People who cannot wait, who, people who cannot uh, pay this, this cost, uh, registration will not be there. And also there is a problems of discrepancy between actual rights and registrations. One issue that has to be remembered for promoting land registration around the world is that it takes a considerable amount of time to reflect the actual rights in the registration. One example could be um, in South Korea, um, early 20th century, the Japan initiated land registry, so-called modern land registration system in Korea in 1910s. And after World War II, the independent South Korea has adopted a land registration system. But it took almost three decades after that when um, most of land registrations were settled uh, without dispute. So if you look at South Korea, we're going to take a look at uh, this country's economic development closely on Friday. But South Korea was known to be uh, the fast economic development cases through from 60s uh, through 80s. But even during that very rapid economic development, land registration is being slowed. The system was there. The requirement was there. But it took three decades to settle the system to reflect accurately on actual rights. So problems of discrepancy is not small. In developing countries, the presumption is that when you have uh, a registration system, then it'll take effect. But the reality is, it'll take effect after a long time. So this, this discrepancy is obviously a source of conflict, a source of inefficiency, and uh, it's going to be a both economic and social problems. Again, in developing countries, it's not uncommon to see problems of multiple registration authorities. So in Nicaragua and Bolivia, there was a central and a local. Because central government has a limited capacity, it had to give a land registration functions in uh, local authorities. It overlapped with certain central governmental uh, functions in registration. It caused confusion and difficulties. Guatemala, in order to avoid that, there was a strong centralization of the system. The problem is that the people residing in localities uh, would have to uh, bear great cost and time and effort of traveling um, and uh, finalizing registration in the capital. So there was an issue with over-centralization. So what it says is that uh, the idea of FPPR is, has a strong merit. And in order to realize that prepare, you will probably need a registration system, a system that shows the actual rights. But implementing, developing and implementing those rights uh, have great difficulties, especially in the socioeconomic context of developing countries. So even in advanced developing country in Korea in, through the 60s and 80s, it took a considerable amount of time to settle it. And by registering, <coughs> by imposing registration system, you will invariably have certain issues of alienation of customary rights and resulting injustice. Because you are adapting land registration system from advanced countries where socioeconomic conditions are different, meaning that they have different set of customary rights, conventional rights, the difference in those rights are cannot, in many cases are not accommodated in the system. So now you have the system, say Cambodia uh, will adopt a uh, hypothetically a land registry system from, say, Korea and Japan. But Japanese and Korean systems do not accommodate the customary rights and conventional uh, 
the land issues in Cambodia adequately and adopting that registration could result in justice because those systems do not take account of local rights and preferences. Okay, <clears throat> so what's the result then? As a result of all these difficulties, the customary land ownership is still dominant. In Africa, the formal land system only covers 2 to 10 percent of the total land area, meaning 90 to 98 percent of total land area is not registered. On the other hand, the customary land tenure, the flexible and secure enough, in the local context at least, to draw land-based <coughs> land investment, so no increase to secure under former title. So in that situation, because of the strength of the local customary rights, adding FPPR doesn't make a whole lot of difference here. On the contrary, now this is uh, Upham's point, Impo imposition of FPPR at the expense of informal communal land rights. On the contrary, results in the loss of important social welfare. So here you have this informal, flexible uh, customary rights, which oftentimes help uh, the socially disadvantaged, say widows and children, they were customary arrangement there. But by making FPPR-based registration, which may not accommodate all those customary rights, enforcing FPPR and that formal system can result in the loss of that conventional uh, customary uh, rights, which will represent important social welfare in that locality. So difficulty associated with the multiplicity of the claims and rights, the GURB rights, now, how do we resolve this? And there are difficulties associated with the multiplicity of claims and rights coming from customary conventions. It's especially compounded where the primary land use is agriculture. So you have a um, household you know, uh, doing the farming work on the land, and um, the land was a seasonally used for some other purpose, you know, after crops are harvested by household B, and then their children can use that land and for certain purposes. All these layers of usage and rights, right, would have to be reflected in the system in ideal. But again, the limited capacity of the state and the complexity would oftentimes prevent that. So failure to register all these rights may harm legitimate claimants as, such as women, youth, and uh, seasonal users. So FPPR becoming a source of social conflict rather than agent of economic development. And there are more problems. Land registration can be manipulated <coughs> by social elites that deprive vulnerable land users of customary land rights cause for social unrest and waste of resource. What this means is that when anybody, any country initiates the land registration, you have to accept um, reports from individuals. So I, who owns the, uh, the land A, would go to the government and say, look, uh, land A belongs to me. I, as a landowner, know that there was a informal rights and customer usage by my neighborhood um, to uh, use the land for some other purpose. That has been done for ages, I know that, but I may not register that right onto my land, right? Or, in many places in Africa where the majority of populations are illiterate, uh, not properly educated, they not, may not even know uh, that they need to register to be recognized of their rights. I, on the other hand, um, I guess landlord in that town, a community leader perhaps, I'm educated, so I know of this requirement of registration, I can go to the you know, public office and claim all the land onto my name. If the government doesn't know about this, or if the government is corrupt, then obviously all this land being registered onto my name could not be prevented. So there's a strong possibility of manipulation of land registration system by social elites. 
So that reflects reality. It can create the multiple uh, lens systems. So by imposing FPPR, you end up with two systems. That, that's a system that's represented by FPPR and customary lens system that reflects on uh, the realities on the ground, customary rights and practices which may not have been registered formally. And Kenya shows that. So FPPR reform, which are promoted by many uh, development agencies in good faith, could result in the worst of all worlds, that you have this very costly system that does not reflect on the real rights, plus the existing right, existing system, which should have been replaced with FPPR, still pretty much alive. So this could be the worst case. Okay. In my view, in order, there are a few things we need to clarify. One is there is a case for FPPR. As I've explained um, in the earlier part of this case, the FPPR works to reduce transaction cost. Um, it tends to increase the individual motivation for efficient use uh, of, of resource, and there are other grounds to support FPPR. However, the implementation is an issue. Um, accommodating the conventional rights and obligations are an issue. And the key there is a state capacity. State capacity to form the registration, enforce it impartially. But we have a big problem here. <coughs> state function is essential to recognize and protect FPPR properly. However, the many states cannot do that. There is a problem with the prevalence of failed states. So according to 2010 Failed States Index compiled by Foreign Policy Magazine and the Fund of Peace, that's a private organizations, nearly 21% of the world countries, 37 countries, are failing state. Another 51% of the world's countries, 91 countries, are states in imminent danger of failing. What do you mean by failed state and failing state? The state that cannot function properly in its key roles, such as the key administration uh, that's required for FPPR. So in many cases, you're trying to implement the system against ineffective state lacking the capacities to recognize and enforce FPPRs. Lack of effective state institutions such as reliable and inexpensive land titling system. We saw the cases of high cost here. A competent and uncorrupted judiciary, which may or may not exist, and a functional police force which would enforce FPPR. All these are um, lacking in many developing countries. Furthermore, state in some cases, has actually become a vehicle to misuse FPPR in favor of social elites. I have implied the possibility of collusion between social elites and the state to deprive the social majority or socially disadvantaged of their land through this FPPR system. And that has happened, and it's a problematic. For example, in Northwest Cameroon, an African country, the land conflicts have increased because local elites seek to acquire land, large tracts of land under individual title, land registration. A process facilitated by the 1974 land ordinance and by the links between the local elites and national politics. In Kenya, a critical contributing factor to the growing social inequality in access to land is the capacity of the patron client chains that link the national elite to the local level to gain control over resources that offer opportunities for accumulation. And much has been done through a land registration system. In Nigeria, political and civil elites benefit disproportionately from the 1978 land use decree by manipulating the allocation authorities. In Somalia, a tragic civil strife 
is rooted in an earlier process of land occupation and expropriation by the state and its governing elites. The Land Law of 1975 enables those with privileged access to the, the mechanisms of registration to obtain titles to land that local farmers had used for generations. So the problems that we have um, elaborated uh, earlier in this lecture are the realities that showing that FPP are becoming the device for the social elite, the socially powerful, and the state to misuse and deprive the disadvantaged, causing social strife. So state agents sometimes offer privatized service for the state service, diminishing the meaning of FPPR. So in this case, protection of property creates uh, high transaction cost. And then this is a problem of neo-patrimonial system, the rulers in alliance with the local strongmen in Africa, the political structure in Africa and many countries where the government rely on local elites, um, tend to push this land registration system as a device uh, of misuse and uh, misallocation rather than the device to improve land efficiency and economic development. So preconditions for the function, good function of FPPR emerges. You have to have certain elements before you're bringing FPPR in place. That is, a consistent legal and institutional framework, broad access to information, and competent and impartial agencies. You need to see all of them in place before you can assure the success of FPPR. That explains why FPPR, imposed by land registration system in many developing countries, did not succeed. A consistent legal and institutional framework, meaning that you have to have a property law that not only clarifies in accordance with good practices of uh, Western and advanced countries, clarifying the elements of property law, but also accommodates and reflects on customary and conventional rights. It has to be part of law. Second, whatever system you put in practice, there has to be a broad access to information uh, on the part of populations. So this might take time and, and it should take time because without this information to populations, then the land registration system has a great chance of being uh, manipulated and misused by social elite. And again, uh, big issues in many developing countries, the agencies, the state agency uh, that undertakes this legal reform has to be competent and impartial. And obviously, we all understand that these are the issues beyond the property law. Let's uh, look at specifically how uh, land reform has been done in uh, some successful and less than successful cases. Okay. Is there any alternative to FPPR for economic development? That's the question that we're going to address. Because we, what we have seen today is that um, we've looked at the merits of FPPR. We understand them. In order to bring up those merits of FPPR for economic development, we are, in, we are promoting the land registration system, among others. And we saw huge problems associated with it and mixed results. And then the question we have is, is there any other way uh, to use property rights for economic development? And as a part of the process, we look at how things happened in successful cases. Now, land reforms in Japan and Korea after World War II. And yes, there was a grant of FPPR to single-family farmers. It did promote social change, because it, in both countries that FPPR, modern FPPR, eliminated uh, the, social, uh, the predominant uh, landlords and promoted small-scale farmers and the middle class. So it promoted social change and democracy, and importantly, rural support for the more new government. But again, there was no significant increase in agricultural productivity. In case of China, rapid development of China in the absence of full protection of property rights 
have been uh, bewildering many scholars and practitioners, but that was a reality. And it was not until property law of 2007, only a few years back, that FPPR was not formally granted in China. There was a weak judicial enforcement of property rights, especially against powerful parties, it's still going on. Yet, we had a vibrant, market-based uh, economic growth in China without FPPR. Then what else happened there? The Chinese markets relied on a range of informal, as well as formal, norms and institutions rather than law. So if you're familiar with the Chinese economic uh, development and industrial situation, you've heard the name, the term guanxi, which is a personal relationship. It looks as a very fragile and individual and private arrangement, but it has been working to a large extent to promote economic um, activities in China, including financial market development and industrial development. So this is one case of showing that FPPR was not essential to bringing up economic development um, in, in China. On the contrary, Cambodia, um, another successful story of economic development. Um, it grew over 7% in terms of GDP on average since the mid-90s. So this is a fast economic growth case. And they embarked on modern land reform along the line that we have discussed. So there was a privatization of land in 1989 and um, registration law of 1992. Let me explain uh, a bit about each of this. Privatization of land in 1989 was a state instruction on the implementation of land use and management policy dated on uh, June 1989. It required the state to grant ownership rights over residential land of no more than 2,000 square meters and possession rights over agricultural land of no more than 5 hectares. The instruction required all landlords to apply for land possession and land ownership within a period of 6 months and another extended period of 6 months after that. So, until June 1990, approximately 3.7 million land applications, accounting for 70% of the total land parcels, uh, were applied. So, this was a large success uh, in, in this case. But the subsequent land registration law of 1992 uh, was not nearly as successful. 1992 land law um, provided penalty such as confiscation of property, which is pretty strong, not registered after five years from the date when the 1992 land law came into effect. But registration, for the reasons that I've explained, again, Cambodia, um, is uh, much of the land is rural, uh, uneducated people. So registration, even with this strong penalty of confiscation, was not going through well enough. And only 12% of land applications as of 2000. So, on one hand, the privatization took some effect, but the land registration law, subsequent land registration law of 1992, was not successful, resulting in only 12% registration. So, another attempt Cambodian law, land law of 2001. It formalized pre-existing de facto position and prohibiting subsequent informal position. So, no informal position by the law. Computerized registry developed with the satellite technology. So, the idea is that if you click on any part of Cambodian land on the map, it'll bring up uh, the you know the ownership relations, uh, property holders. It's a very advanced system that they have uh, contemplated. However, from 2002 to April 2010, systematic land registration projects so far shipped only 1.3 million systematic uh, registration certificates out of 
an estimated set of 10 million land parcels. So 1.3 out of 10 registers uh, as of 2010. But if you look at the Cambodian economic development, so land registration did not go very well at all. 12% registration <coughs> out of 1992 Act, 13% um, out of uh, this record from 2002 to 2010. It's not a great success, but if you look at economic development during that time, they maintained 7% growth. So there is a disconnect here between FPPR again and economic growth. I think there are lessons to be taught uh, from the past cases. And I'm um, hoping to uh, clarify that um, on the last, uh, last segment of this lecture. Um, but uh, before we get to that, let's take a look at two more cases, two more issues on um, property rights and economic development. They are expropriation issues and the foreign investments. So land registration has been an important part of land reform projects, I'm sorry, law reform projects in many developing countries. Another is to create a system that is more inviting um, in terms of foreign investments. So another effort has been made to prevent a, you know, a rampant expropriation by the state and protect investment, especially foreign investment. So we have to take a look at those two before we're getting to a uh, concluding part as to how we you know, make a better use of FPPR, uh, a better use of the registration system. Uh, so let's take a look at them. Expropriation, that's a taking of property by the state, is internationally recognized sovereign state rights. So every state um, has a right to expropriate, but on a certain conditions. The requirements. Yes, a state can expropriate. So me, the, inv the private investor, goes into a country and um, own a property and undertake a project, and obviously the state has a right to take my property. It seems very unfair, but the international law recognized that under certain uh, criteria. That is, that expropriation is done for a public objective. Economic development would obviously be one of them. It should not be discriminatory. So when expropriation is conducted, it has to be fair. It, ha it should not be discriminatory. And a third uh, has to be a fair compensation. But there's argument as to whether the fair compensation means out-of-pocket cost or market value. Um, but in either standard, you have to provide a degree of compensation. And there is, in fact, increased need for expropriation in the earlier stages of economic development. And that's primarily for the need to build infrastructure, like right? roads, and dams, um, you know, such as that. So, because the government doesn't have uh, enough resources, and oftentimes expropriation is a means to do this, to build infrastructure essential for earlier stage of economic development, uh, such as roads and dams. But expropriation causes. Uh, some other important issues such as human rights, and obviously if you're building a dam, for instance, then if you're taking property, um, the people, for instance, living in that region will be uh, flooded, obviously, by the construction of dam. They have to be evacuated. They have to be moved. And again, the developing countries cannot afford um, enough compensation in some cases, and those people are driven out of their home by state uh, compulsion and the loss of their livelihood, and etc. So there are human rights issues associated with it. And there are environmental issues. Obviously, construction of certain uh, infrastructure can damage the environment in that region. And again, uh, one of the most important issues, compensation. Now, developing countries tend to argue that the compensation should be limited to uh, out-of-pocket cost. If there is any cost to develop the property, then that should be compensated, versus the market value of the property. 
But either way, the compensation、uh, could be made difficult in developing countries without enough resources. In the context of foreign investment,、um, this expropriation causes some issues. And how does it happen? Well, again,、uh, the government can expropriate any property for a public purpose, including economic development reasons. And foreign investments have been nationalized. And one good example is a、uh, revolution of Iran when Iran was revolutionized by the Islamic、uh, factions. Then、uh, the state exercised new Islamic state of Iran exercised their rights to nationalize a certain、uh, foreign investment, especially in the area of oil and gas. It did take place, and requirements obviously apply. So、uh, the tribunal has been established after the nationalization between Iran and the United States and Washington, and that Iran、uh, U.S. tribunal are settles with. The、um, issues arising from expropriation, such as compensation. So there were thousands of cases settled in that tribunal by arbitration to resolve compensation issues. Again, as I mentioned, that there is a question about what constitutes fair compensation. Is it the、uh, the market value as advocated by developed countries, or out of pocket cost? And in many cases, there are、uh, investment treaties. Made between the developed and developing countries, and that oftentimes that bilateral investment treaties (BITs) stipulate what has to be a compensation in the case of expropriation. Another interesting case about property rights, expropriation, and、um, investment is currency issue. When you expropriate, can you provide compensation in terms of local currency? Now, the international cases. Tend to argue that、uh, the compensation has to be effective. So, if the currency of developing countries cannot be used abroad, which is often the case, we call it、uh, unconvertible. The, the currency has to be convertible,、um, and convertible currencies are, you know, dollars, euros, uh, pounds, uh, maybe Japanese yens.、Uh, if if the currencies are not provided in those currencies, then、uh, there are issues. Again, the BIT, the bilateral investment treaties, tend to stipulate that. So、uh, these are the issues that have to be、uh, settled in relation to、uh, property rights and expropriation, and it tends to be important because most developing countries are in need of foreign investment, and、uh, one of the most important issues、uh, vis-à-vis property investment is、uh, the treatment of expropriation and the measure of compensation when it happens. Okay, the final points. <coughs> Now, the、uh, as I have repeated a few times, the most difficult issues about property laws and rights and economic development is a treatment of FPPR. As many scholars have studied and many protection practitioners have noted, there are positive economies of、F、FPPR. You can go back to earlier slides and we'll see them. But the cases on the ground have made it very clear that FPPR alone does not facilitate economic development. You have to have some infrastructure before FPPR to take effect. What are those infrastructure? There has to be a well-functioning credit and insurance markets, insurance that protects. For the contingency of the title and the credit slash financial market, that can make use of FPPR. That has to be there first before the market can benefit from it. So, the financial situation, market situation, such as a、uh, dominance by the government,、uh, as, as shown in Africa, or a practice of、uh, capital market relying more on non. Formal property assets, such as reputation, the personal property, conventional rights. If these are the conditions of the financial market on the ground, then adding FPPR will have a very limited effect. And also, you would have to have institutional strength. If you do not have a effective judicial、uh, courts 
and the impartial police force, which would recognize and enforce it, then again, FPPR will not take effect because of limited institutional strengths. And good governance, um, even without the democratic elements, you have to have a stable pol political structure. That's also essential for FPPR. So if you look at the development of China, the China FPPR uh, took root uh, rather fast after its uh, reform in 2000. Now, why is it then? Uh, why, within a short period of time, the FPPR tends to be a settle uh, more positively in China and elsewhere for the past 10 years? Because you have those. You have a well-functioning credit market. You do have insurance market in China. You do have institutional strength. And you have a good governance in terms of political stability. So that's the reason why FPPR tends to be better working for the past 10 years in China than other places such as Africa. Another point that has been made is before FPPR was put in place, many developing countries including China and even Cambodia as we have seen were making a remarkable progress in economic development without FPPR. This is contrary to the assertions made by uh, Weber or Hayek or um, some even uh, later economists and practitioners arguing that FPP are essential for economic development, but this is a case that shows otherwise. Now, having said that, most developing countries are trying to adopt FPPR for its merits and economy. But the reality is that in many countries, FPPR, are, is, is the system that supports FPPR is not the only system, but it's part of plural land systems which coexist with the primary customary systems uh, that has been there for a long time. So duality, even multiplicity, of systems are the reality. The cost of establishing and maintaining the existing formal land system must be carefully assessed. So what do we do from here? What do we do from here? I think there is a merit in adopting FPPR for the reasons we have explained at length. But we have to be careful about the cost of establishing, that means both social and economic cost, of establishing and maintaining the system. In other words, you have to take time. The idea to implement FPPR in the period of five years, maybe even 10 years, may not be realistic because of the existence of customary uh, practices and informal rights, which are difficult, if not impossible, to be accommodated in the formal system in a short period of time. It requires years of research, understanding. so. That cost has to be implemented in the designing of system to give sufficient time. And understanding is that even in a successful developing case, development cases in Japan and Korea, it took ages, it took decades before it has achieved a reasonably working FPPR system. So that has to be noted. If you don't do that, then the cost may far outweigh the benefits of FPPR as shown in a number of developing countries. And I think in this sense that Frank Upham is right if you do not account for the cost and prepare for them by taking more time and approaching more carefully, more flexibility, then FPPR can be a cause of social strife rather than agent of economic development. So there has to be judicial and administrative flexibility to recognize customary land systems. So I think, in my personal view, it would be a mistake to create a system that denies all the customary rights and informal rights not registered per se. One, people resist. So in, as shown in Cambodia, it resulted in a very low rate of registration. So that doesn't seem to work. The judiciary and administration would be prepared to take into account of the existence of informal rights and case by case that has to be recognized. And there has to be measure of protection against attempts by social elites 
to misuse the formal system. That requires impartial government, um, which is, again, a difficult proposition in many developing countries, but some measure of preparation should be made. So all it points out to the proposition that gradual consolidation, which will be prepared for decades of preparation implementation, and case-by-case -case approach is absolutely essential for the success of FPPR um, and the contribution to economic development.